Peace be upon you. So in the context of a black hole, there's a boundary known as the event horizon. Anything that traverses beyond that event horizon will never be able to escape the gravitational pull of that black hole. And the reason is, is beyond that threshold, beyond that boundary, the gravitational pull is so high that in order to be able to theoretically escape it, the escape velocity exceeds the speed of light. And this renders it impossible for anything that crosses this boundary to ever be able to return. Similarly, consider the boundary of morality. That there's a certain threshold that if someone traverses, crosses, that it's a moral event horizon that they will never be able to return back to righteousness. That they've exceeded the bounds of what is permissible. And their days here on earth is no different than those already in the graves destined for hell. But the question is, where is this boundary? How do we make sure we never come near this boundary? And how do we determine when someone has crossed that boundary? In order to address these questions, we have to first define what is righteousness. For millennia, people debated if righteousness had to do with beliefs or with actions. Historically, the Jews put more emphasis on actions, thinking that if someone conducts themselves a certain way, performs certain practices, is rigid in their actions, that their belief doesn't really matter. And in the Quran, it addresses these, and we also see this term used in the Bible, of those whose hearts are uncircumcised, that despite being circumcised in the flesh, their hearts, their, their belief is uncircumcised, that they lack righteousness of the heart. And on the flip side, you have Christians, predominantly those who ascribe to the teachings of Paul, that they say it has 100% to do with belief and nothing to do with actions. That if someone holds the right belief, and in their context that has to do with believing that Jesus died for your sins, that your actions really don't matter if you hold the right belief. Now, where the Quran comes down on this, it shows that both are absolutely required in order to have salvation, in order to be able to deem someone as righteous, that they have to have the right beliefs as well as the right actions. In righteousness, it's defined in Surah 2, verse 177. It says, righteousness is not turning your faces towards the east or the west. Righteous are those who believe. So first, it starts off with belief in God the last day, the angels, the scripture, and the prophets. Now it's going to talk about the actions. And they give the money cheerfully to the relatives, the orphans, the needy, the traveling alien, the beggars, and to free the slaves. And they observe the contact per salat and give the obligatory charity zakat. And they keep their word whenever they make a promise. And they steadfastly persevere in the face of persecution, hardship, and war. These are the truthful these are the righteous. So righteousness, according to the Quran, requires both belief and actions. If someone has the wrong beliefs, but the right actions, they might benefit in this world. But when it comes to the hereafter, they will have no share. And alternatively, if someone has the right belief, but the wrong actions, then therefore their actions actually dictate what's really inside their hearts. So these two things have to be there, the right belief and the right actions for one to be deemed as righteous. But there's another two prerequisites before one can even get to this stage. Firstly, it requires the ability for that individual to be able to distinguish between right and wrong. If someone is incapable of distinguishing between right and wrong, we would never hold that person responsible. You know, imagine a child. If a child commits a crime, let's say a baby, you know, we can't hold the baby responsible. We say, look, the, the baby does not know between right and wrong. We only hold people responsible for what they know. The second thing that's required is the ability to choose between right and wrong. Let's say someone is forced into giving charity. You know, you can't call that person charitable because they're not doing it freely. They're being forced into it. So in order for someone to be righteous, not only do they have to have the right actions and the right uh, uh, beliefs, they also have to have the ability to be able to distinguish between right and wrong and the ability to choose between right and wrong. And the Quran informs us 
that this is given to every single human being. Firstly, God gave every human being the instinctive knowledge of monotheism. In Surah 30, verse 30, it reads, Therefore you shall devote yourself to the religion of strict monotheism. Such is the natural instinct placed into the people by God. Such creation of God will never change. This is the perfect religion, but most people do not know. So no one can make the excuse that they didn't know they were supposed to worship God alone. We have another verse in Surah 7, verse 172. It says that God summoned all the descendants of Adam, that's me, you, every single human being, and had us bear witness for ourselves that there's only one God. This is in Surah 7, verse 172. So this is all instinctive knowledge that God has placed in us, this, this belief in monotheism. Secondly, God has given us the understanding between right and wrong. In Surah 91, verse 7, it says, The soul in him who created it then showed it what is evil and what is good. And the word that's used here for uh, showing between what's evil and good is alham. Alham means to place innate knowledge in it. So God placed innate knowledge in us to distinguish between good and evil. So now that we have this understanding to worship God alone, to be able to distinguish between right and wrong, God now gave the human being the freedom to choose for themselves. So in Surah 33, verse 72, it says, We have offered the responsibility, and this is the freedom of choice, to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, but they refused to bear it and were afraid of it. But the human being accepted it. He was transgressing ignorant. So we chose the ability to choose between right and wrong. The mountains, the trees, the animals, they didn't want this choice. They didn't want this responsibility. But the human being, we accepted it. Then God in this life shows us the two paths. In Surah 90, verse 10 through 20, it reads, Did we not show him the two paths? He should choose the difficult path. Which one is the difficult path? The freeing of slaves, feeding during the time of hardship, orphans who are related, or the poor who is in need. And being one of those who believe in exhorting one another to be steadfast and exhorting one another to be kind. These have deserved happiness. As for those who disbelieved in our revelations, they have incurred misery. They will be confined in the hellfire. So here we're, we're seeing that God is giving every single soul a choice. They can choose to be righteous or they can choose to be evil. That choice is completely up to them. Now this shows we have everything we need to genuinely be considered righteous. We can distinguish between right and wrong. We can choose between right and wrong. And then at that point, as long as we have the right belief and the right actions, then we're going to be redeemed. But the question is, what happens if someone chooses to go astray? At what point do they cross this moral event horizon where there is no return? And the simple answer to this is when the person is blind to their own sin and refuses to acknowledge it. In Surah 2 verse 8 through 12, we read the traits of the hypocrites. It reads, Then there are those who say we believe in God in the last day, while they are not believers. In trying to deceive God and those who believe, they only deceive themselves without perceiving. In their minds there is a disease. Consequently, God augments their disease. They have incurred a painful retribution for their lying. When they are told, do not commit evil, they say, but we are righteous. In fact, they are evildoers, but they do not perceive. So these people genuinely believe, they've convinced themselves, they've tricked themselves, that what they're doing is righteous. And in 4056, we read, Surely those who argue against God's revelations without proof are exposing the arrogance that is hidden inside their chest and they're not even aware of it. That means that there's individuals who get to the point where even when they're confronted by their arrogance, their sinfulness, they will not uh, acknowledge it. And no, not only do they not acknowledge it, they actually trick themselves into thinking that it's righteous. And we read this in 35.8. It says, Note the one whose evil work is adorned in his eyes until he thinks that it is righteous. God thus sends astray whoever wills to go astray, and he guides whoever wills to be guided. Therefore, do not grieve over them. God is fully aware of everything they do. Now, the reality is only God knows what is in each individual's innermost thoughts. God merely creates the conditions by which that person can see for themselves the wickedness that lies within. 
And it's at that point that that individual has a choice. They can either come around, repent, reform, come back to God's kingdom, or they can choose to continue going astray and not acknowledge their shortcomings, their sins, and over time actually convince themselves that what they're doing is righteous. So consider the following scenario. Someone who slowly is falling into sin. That at first, they may attribute their shortcomings to their weaknesses, but this will cause discomfort in the form of dissonance for the person. This is because most sensible people dislike beliefs that are incongruent with their actions. So if I say, yes, I believe that everyone should uh, tell the truth, and I go around lying, that's going to eat at me. Most people don't like having that form of dissonance. So eventually, the dissonance will get to be too much, and they will slowly start to self-justify and create excuses for their bad behavior. And this will make them feel more comfortable in their sinful ways. Once this happens, then over time, the person will no longer be capable of distinguishing between right and wrong because they've lied to themselves so much that they started accepting and believing their lies. So now when they're called out for their unrighteousness, in their eyes, in their mind, they see it as righteous. Consider a person who initially values honesty, but finds themselves in a competitive work environment where bending the truth is seen as a way to gain an advantage. Initially, they might resist engaging in dishonesty, attributing their reluctance to their strong moral principles, However, under continuous pressure to succeed in witnessing others benefit from their dishonest practices, they might tell a small lie to secure a deal or promotion, justifying it as a necessary action for survival or success in their field. You know, consider being a student and recognizing all your peers are cheating on the test. So you justify maybe a little bit of cheating just to be able to maintain your status within the group. And over time, as they continue to compromise their values, the initial discomfort of dishonesty will diminish. They'll begin to rationalize their behavior, convincing themselves that everyone else does it, and that it's the only way to stay ahead, or that their actions are justified by the outcome they achieve. You know, they tell themselves, they say, look, if I get a good grade, I'm going to get a good job, and I'm going to be able to give more to charity. If I close this deal, I'm going to get a bigger commission, and I'm going to be able to do more righteous works and provide for my family. This rationalization serves to reduce the cognitive dissonance experienced between their actions and their original moral beliefs. Eventually, if this pattern persists, the person's moral compass becomes distorted. The innate knowledge of right and wrong becomes overshadowed by a series of justifications and rationalizations. In this state, distinguishing between ethical and unethical behavior becomes challenging because their decision-making becomes muddled. They might no longer feel guilt or moral conflict about actions that they would have found reprehensible just a little while ago. And this indicates a shift in their moral baseline. And you progress this forward, and eventually, they will start justifying sinful acts as righteous. And when they're called out upon it, they will not recognize it, and they will not repent, and they will not reform. And at that point, they are never going to return. Every soul has the possibility of being redeemed. But if they continue down that path, papering over their sins, convincing themselves that they're righteous, they're going to be just as hopeless as the disbelievers who are already in the grave. We have this example with Pharaoh. When God told Moses to go to Pharaoh, it reads in Surah 20, verse 43 and 44, it says, Go to Pharaoh, for he transgressed. Speak to him nicely. He may take heed or become reverent. Meaning at this point in Pharaoh's life, despite all the atrocities he committed, all the, the sinful acts he's done, there was the element that he had the potential within him to take heed, and to become reverent. But what happened when Moses went to Pharaoh and proclaimed to let the children of Israel go? We read in Surah 26, verse 16 through 22, it says, Go to Pharaoh and say, We are messengers from the Lord of the universe. Let the children of Israel go. He, Pharaoh said, Did we not raise you from infancy? And you spent many years with us. Then you committed the crime that you committed, and you were ungrateful. He said, Moses, said, Indeed, I did it when I was astray. Then I fled when I feared you. 
and my Lord endowed me with wisdom and made me one of the messengers. You are boasting that you did me a favor while enslaving the children of Israel. So when Pharaoh is confronted with his atrocities, with his sins, of the, 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 the persecution, the oppression, the murder that he's committing, rather than becoming uh, reverent, rather than taking heed, he's doubling down. He's convincing himself that what he did and what he's doing is righteous. And we see that as this progresses with each progressive miracle that Moses presented to Pharaoh, his heart became hardened until the point of no return. In Surah 10 verse 88, we read Moses' prayer against Pharaoh. It reads, Moses said, Our Lord, you have given Pharaoh and his elders luxuries and wealth in this world. Our Lord, they only use them to repulse others from your path. Our Lord, wipe out their wealth and harden their hearts to prevent them from believing until they see the painful retribution. Pharaoh's transgressions became so great, he became so blinded by his arrogance that he was incapable of seeing his sins. And because of that, there was no return, no possibility of return for Pharaoh. He was doomed. He was going to hell. And despite the fact that he had additional time on this planet, his destiny was as certain as the disbelievers who were already in the grave. The only reason he persisted was because God had a specific plan to annihilate him and his troops and to confirm the degree of sinfulness that he had in his heart. One of the most iconic examples of an entity that crossed this moral event horizon that was destined for hell, that will never repent and reform and come back to God's path, is that of Satan. God created a condition by which Satan could see for himself why he was arrogant and why he was destined for hell. God created this lowly creature called Adam and had all the angels fall prostrate before him. And this was strictly to expose Satan's arrogance in his heart. It reads in Surah 7 verse 11, it says, We created you, then we shaped you. Then we said to the angels, fall prostrate before Adam. They fell prostrate except Iblis, Satan. He was not with the prostrators. When God questions Iblis about this decision he made, Satan doesn't ask for forgiveness. He doesn't repent. He doesn't reform. He doubles down on his decision. And he asks God, he begs God for respite till the day of resurrection so he can attempt to prove his point. This shows that Satan wanted to go to hell. He's willing to go to hell if it means that he, he's given the opportunity to try to prove his point. That his arrogance, his ego was so large that that was more important for him than having salvation, than being allowed into God's kingdom. It reads in Surah 7 verse 12 through 18, it says, He said, What prevented you from prostrating when I ordered you? He said, I'm better than he. You created me from fire and created him from mud. He said, Therefore, you must go down, for you are not to be arrogant here. Get out, you are debased. He said, Grant me a respite until the day of resurrection. He said, You are granted a respite. He said, since you have willed that I go astray, I will skulk for them on your straight path. I will come to them from before them and from behind them and from their right and from their left. And you'll find that most of them are unappreciative. He said, get out there from despised and defeated. Those among them who follow you, I will fill hell with you all. So in this exchange, we see that Satan on his own volition is choosing to go to hell. God is giving him the opportunity to repent, to reform, but Satan doesn't want it. Now contrast this with the response from Adam. God created Adam and his spouse, put them into paradise with one simple rule. Do not approach this tree. Now let's see how Adam responds to the situation. In Surah 7 verse 19 through 23, it reads, As for you, Adam, dwell with your wife in paradise and eat therefrom as you please. But do not approach this one tree lest you fall in sin. The devil whispered to them in order to reveal their bodies, which were invisible to them. He said, Your Lord did not forbid you from this tree, except to prevent you from becoming angels and from attaining eternal existence. He swore to them, I am giving you good advice. He thus duped them with lies. As soon as they tasted the tree, their bodies became visible to them, and they tried to cover themselves with the leaves of paradise. Their Lord called upon them, Did I not enjoin you from that tree and warn you that the devil is your most ardent enemy? They said, Our Lord, we have wronged our souls, and unless you forgive us and have mercy on us, we will be losers. 
So the distinction here is that while Satan, when he was called out for his transgression, his disobedience, he doubled down. He continued down that path of straying. He refused to acknowledge his shortcoming. He thought what he was doing was right. Adam, on the other hand, when he was confronted, he felt shame. He felt remorse. He sought God's forgiveness. And because of that, God redeemed him. God gave him words by which he could redeem himself, put him onto this earth for him to be able to fix the error of his ways so he can come back to God's kingdom without this deficiency. This example of Satan and Adam show us what the difference is when someone crosses that boundary of no return versus the opportunity for redemption. The one who crosses that boundary of no return will never acknowledge the sins that they've committed. They will convince themselves that they are righteous. This self-righteousness, this ego that they have is going to cause them to never return back to God's kingdom. Because if you want to be redeemed into God's kingdom, you have to repent and you have to reform. But if you never acknowledge that you have this deficiency, that you've ever committed a sin, that you are committing idol worship, then you will never repent and reform. And the only destiny for that person is hell. But someone who is called out for it recognizes their shortcoming, recognizes that they've fallen into sin. For that person, there's hope. God allows them to repent and reform. But if they don't take heed and correct their ways, then they're going to progress down that path. And at some point, there is going to be no return for them. Consider the, the, the history of Abraham. Abraham goes and he destroys the idols of his people and he leaves the big one there. And when the people confront him, he, he says, he says, look, it's the big one who did it. And it says in that moment, they recognized within themselves that they were the ones who were astray, yet they reverted back to their old ways. And they turned this blessing from God into a curse that God was showing them, allowing them to see for themselves that they were transgressors. Yet because their egos were too large, they were uh, too committed to their idol worship, they turned blind. In Surah 22, verse 46 says, Did they not roam the earth, then use their minds to understand and use their ears to hear? Indeed, the real blindness is not the blindness of the eyes, but the blindness of the hearts inside the chest. These people are going against their natural programming to worship God alone, to be able to distinguish between right and wrong. And they're overriding this source code with their ego, putting their own opinions above that of what God is commanding them to do in order to be redeemed. And God knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows what's inside our hearts. God creates the conditions by which we can see for ourselves what's inside our hearts through our actions, through our deeds. So on the day of resurrection, we will have no excuse. God does this by means of a test. Now, there's two forms of tests. One form of test is to prove our belief. And this happens to all those who claim to believe. In Surah 29, verse 2 and 3, it reads, Do the people think that they will be left to say we believe without being put to the test? We have tested those before them, for God must distinguish those who are truthful, and he must expose the liars. This test is facilitated to make sure that the individual who claims to believe in God does so under all circumstances, when they're rich, when they're poor, when they're in good health, and when they're not. And under all circumstances, if they prove that they worship God alone, then they're admitted into God's kingdom. But there's a second kind of test, and this test has to do when we slip, when we do what Adam did, where we approach something where we're not supposed to approach. And for that test, God puts us in the conditions by which we can eradicate that shortcoming. In Surah 42, verse 30, it says, Anything bad that happens to you is a consequence of your own deeds, and he overlooks many of your sins. Meaning that if we commit sin, we have to pay for it. Now, there's different ways that this can come to resolution. If we sin out of ignorance, sheer ignorance, God says that he will forgive us and we don't have to pay for it. So in 4.17, it says, Repentance is acceptable by God from those who fall in sin out of ignorance, then repent immediately thereafter. God redeems them. God is omniscient, most wise. Meaning if there's a slip of the tongue or something happens that I, uh, you know, for a moment I commit sin and then I catch myself and I repent, God says he overlooks that. Uh, similarly, we see in Surah 16, verse 119, says, Yet as regards those who fall in sin out of ignorance, then repent thereafter 
and reform your Lord after this is done is forgiver most merciful. Now this is different than someone who sins intentionally. For those who sin intentionally, they have to pay for their sin. It reads in Surah 25 verse 60, it says, They never implore beside God any other God, nor do they kill any soul, for God has made life sacred, except in the course of justice, nor do they commit adultery. Those who commit these offenses will have to pay. Meaning if we do one of these serious offenses where it's premeditation, it's not just, you know, accidentally uh, uh, occurs, God says you have to pay. Now the question is, how can we pay for such sins? One way is by paying via righteous deeds. And when we do righteous deeds, it actually covers our sinful behavior. So in Surah 11, verse 114, it says, You shall observe the contact prayer salat at both ends of the day and during the night. It says, The righteous works wipe out the evil works. This is a reminder for those who would take heed. Another method is via hardship. Sometimes we transgress, we commit sin, and we have to go through the hardship in order to be redeemed. And this is what happened to Adam. When Adam approached that tree, he ate from it. He was sent down here on earth where he had to work hard to redeem himself. In Surah 16, verse 112, we have this example. It says, God cites the example of a community that used to be secure and prosperous with provisions coming to it from everywhere. But then it turned unappreciative of God's blessings. Consequently, God caused them to taste the hardships of starvation and insecurity. Such is the record for what they did. God had to temporarily remove provisions from this community, had to make them taste insecurity in order that they can learn to be appreciative. Now, God does this out of his mercy, out of his grace. It's not meant to be done in order strictly to punish them. The punishment happens if they don't repent, they don't take heed, they don't reform. Then they will continue down that path because they will never acknowledge the follies of their way. In Surah 4, verse 147, it reads, What will God gain from punishing you if you became appreciative and believed? God is appreciative, omniscient. Meaning that the function of going through this hardship, going through these challenges when we commit sin, is to get us back on the right track. Because it's better to pay for those sins in this life than have to carry them for all of eternity in the hereafter. And we have another example in Surah 7, verse 94 and 95. says, Whenever we sent a prophet to any community, we afflicted its people with adversity and hardship that they may implore. Then we substituted peace and prosperity in place of that hardship. But at last they turned heedless and said, It was our parents who experienced that hardship before prosperity. Consequently, we punished them suddenly when they least expected. So God imposes this hardship on the people in order for them to become reverent. But if they choose not to, if they continue to be willfully blind, to be heedless to God's message, then there is no returning for them. There is no repentance, reforming, redemption, because that's something they have to choose for themselves. God gives people every excuse to come back to his path. He incentivizes them by saying that he will transform their sins into credits. Think of this, you commit a whole life of sin, that God will transform those sins into credits if you repent and reform. So this takes us back to those prerequisites. First, you have to acknowledge that what we've done is wrong. We have to acknowledge our sin. Then we have to make the active choice to go towards righteousness on our own volition. In Surah 13, verse 11, it says, God does not change the condition for any people until they themselves make the decision to change. This is something that falls upon us. We simply have to make the decision to change. And if we do this sincerely, wholeheartedly, God will direct us towards righteousness. But if at that moment we choose not to change, we choose to double down in our blindness, in our arrogance, in our sinful ways, then again, we will never be able to repent, we will never be able to reform, and we will never be redeemed back into God's kingdom. So God creates these conditions for us to implore Him, to turn wholeheartedly to Him alone. In Surah 6, verse 42 and 43, it says, We have sent messengers to communities before you, and we put them to the test through adversity and hardship that they may implore. If only they implored when our tests afflicted them, instead, their hearts were hardened, and the devil adorned their works in their eyes. God creates these conditions 
in order for those entities to implore God to be able to be granted righteousness, to be able to granted guidance so they can make it back to God's kingdom. Now, several times in the Quran, God uses the following metaphor. It reads in Surah 17, verse 67, it says, If you are afflicted in the middle of the sea, you abandon your idols and sincerely implore him alone. But as soon as he saves you to the shore, you revert. Indeed, the human being is unappreciative. We see a similar in 3132. It says, when violent waves surround them, they implore God, sincerely devoting their prayers to him alone. But as soon as he saves them to the shore, some of them revert. None discards our revelations except those who are betrayers unappreciative. Now, what's interesting with this metaphor is that the you know concept of being astray you know, being lost at sea or being astray is one and the same. And then they implore God sincerely seeking his help. And when God saves them to the shore, and what's interesting is the Arabic word for shore, abari, is the same as the word for righteousness, biri. It's just one vowel difference. It's the same root. So God saves them from being astray back to righteousness. And what do they do? They become unappreciative. And in Arabic, the word for unbelief, disbelief, and for being unappreciative, is the same word, kufr. So these individuals, they're astray. They implore God sincerely devoted to him alone. He saves them to the shore, the righteousness, only for them to revert back into disbelief, to be unappreciative of God. And when they do that, at a certain point, again, they will stop acknowledging their sin. They will start convincing themselves that their sinful ways are actually righteous. And at that point, they're so astray that they've crossed that threshold, that uh, metaphorical moral event horizon, that the gravitational pull is so strong that they will never come back to God's kingdom. In Surah 3, verse 90, it reads, Those who disbelieve after believing, then plunge deeper into disbelief. Their repentance will not be accepted from them. They are the real strayers. The reason that their repentance will not be accepted is because they will never repent. They will never seek God's forgiveness. Because they're convinced, they're utterly convinced that their ways are righteous. We see again in 4137, says, surely those who believe, then disbelieve, then di believe, then disbelieve, then plunge deeper into disbelief. They cross, they transgress that moral event horizon. That they fall deeper into disbelief. God will not forgive them, nor will he guide them in any way. So how do we know if someone, you know, God forbid, if we reach that moral event horizon, it's that we convince ourselves that our sinful ways are righteous. That when God has us witness for ourselves our sinful ways, rather than becoming reverent, taking heed, repenting, seeking God's forgiveness, we double down, we become self-righteous. We convince ourselves that what we're doing is righteous. And for these, there is no hope. But how do you know? How do you know that if you've crossed that? The way we know this is that if you're still feeling bad for the sins we've committed, if we acknowledge the sins that we're committing, if we're sincerely devoted to God alone, God will not allow us to cross that threshold. God will not allow us to go beyond the moral event horizon where there is no return. Now look at this example. In Surah 24 verse 40, it says, Another allegory is that of being in total darkness, in the midst of a violent ocean, with waves upon waves in addition to thick fog, darkness upon darkness. I'm going to pause. Can you imagine a more dire, a more dark, a more black situation? It's not possible. Yet, we continue reading. It says, darkness upon darkness. If he looked at his own hand, he could barely see it. Whomever God the prize of light will have no light. And it's interesting that it doesn't say he cannot see his own hand. It says he can barely see it. My takeaway from this is that despite all this darkness, despite how far astray someone has become, as long as they can see a glimmer of God's guidance and they can determine that by realizing their sinful ways, there's possibility for redemption for them. But once their heart becomes hardened, that even when it's exposed to them that what they're doing is idol worship, what they're doing is sinful, it's horrendous, it's tyrannical, when they refuse to acknowledge that, then there is no return for that person. They've plunged too far deep into that black hole and they will never return. But God gives us this beautiful, beautiful reminder. It says, proclaim, O my servants who exceeded the limits, never despair of God's mercy, for God forgives all sins. He is the forgiver most merciful. God is telling us that his mercy, his forgiveness is infinite. 
The only thing it requires is for the person themselves to acknowledge that they need God's forgiveness, that without God, they're destined for hell. And it tells us in 7146, it says, I will divert from my revelations those who are arrogant on earth without justification. Consequently, when they see every kind of proof, they will not believe. And when they see the path of guidance, they will not adopt it as their path. But when they see the path of straying, they will adopt it as their path. This is the consequence of their rejecting our proofs and being totally heedless thereof. God gives every soul its guidance. God gives every soul its ability to distinguish between right and wrong. And God gives the free will to the human being to decide for themselves which path they choose to follow. God being most gracious, most merciful, is not going to force people to believe, but he gives them every reason to believe, every reason to seek his forgiveness, to implore him alone, to return back to God's kingdom. But someone who refuses God's guidance, who refuses to accept God's mercy, then there is no redemption for them. When Satan was confronted with his folly, rather than humbling himself, rather than recognizing his sin, he doubles down. And this is what most people do. They choose to go to hell. God does not send anyone to hell. God creates the system by which each individual soul can choose for themselves. Do they want the path of redemption or do they want the path of darkness, abyss, and hell? So someone who chooses that path has no one to blame except themselves. And God willing, we're going to end with some verses. This is in Surah 25, starting from verse 63 through 77. It says, The worshippers of the Most Gracious are those who tread the earth gently. And when the ignorant speak to them, they only utter peace. In the privacy of the night, they meditate on their Lord and fall prostrate. And they say, Our Lord, spare us the agony of hell. Its retribution is horrendous. It is the worst abode, the worst destiny. When they give, they are neither extravagant nor stingy. They give in moderation. They never implore beside God any other God, nor do they kill any soul, for God has made life sacred, except in the course of justice. Nor do they commit adultery. Those who commit these offenses will have to pay. Retribution is doubled for them on the day of resurrection, and they abide therein humiliated, exempted, are those who repent, believe, and lead a righteous life. God transforms their sins into credits. God is forgiver most merciful. Those who repent and lead a righteous life, God redeems them a complete redemption. They do not bear false witness. When they encounter vain talk, they ignore it. When reminded of their Lord's revelations, they never react to them as if they were deaf and blind. And they say, Our Lord, let our spouses and children be a source of joy for us and keep us in the forefront of the righteous. These are the ones who attain paradise in return for their steadfastness. They are received therein with joyous greetings and peace. Eternally they abide therein. What a beautiful destiny. What a beautiful abode. Say, you attain value at my Lord only through your worship. If you disbelieve, you incur the inevitable consequences. God willing, we're going to end there. If you guys want to get in contact, please join us on our Discord server. we got a thriving community of people who want to worship God alone, follow the Quran alone, and we'd love to have you there. If you want to follow along the verses of the Quran, you can download the Quran City app on the iOS app store. If you don't have an iOS device, you can go to QuranCityApp.com website. If you want notes from today's discussion, you can go to Quran Talk blog. Uh, you can find notes from today's discussion as well as articles on numerous topics. And if you want more regular updates as far as what's going on, please follow me on Twitter at TalkQuran. And until next time, peace and God bless.